So our, our guest speaker tonight, our keynote speaker, is Frank Edelboot, and he is the commissioner of the New Hampshire Department of Education. He's been that since 2000, February 2017, basically responsible for all of the organizational goals of that department, as well as on boards of the university system and a variety of other education-based uh, institutions throughout the state. His vision is to make education accessible to everyone and to improve how we educate our children in that state. Children are the future. And if we don't educate them properly, we will certainly wish we had. I'm familiar with how they conduct education in other countries, particularly Japan. It is a mania there that your children will succeed and learn everything possible. We need to have something like that. Frank is the man to bring that to the party. I've been very impressed every time I talk to him about this. Frank's background is in business. He's a CPA, worked for large companies, eventually set out as an entrepreneur, built his own company starting in his kitchen, got thrown out of the kitchen, took over a bedroom, if I remember correctly. <laughs> <laughs> Kathleen made sure of that, yes. So he built that up and eventually sold it. And now he's devoting himself to public service, uh, doing some investings in startup companies, which I admire once again moving the ball forward. Uh, I got engaged in this because Frank reached out to us in Granite State Taxpayers. He was assembling all of the groups that are involved in the creation of an effective education system. And you think of teachers, you think of parents, well taxpayers, taxpayers are actually paying the bill. It's not always the parents, as you know. But um, one of the things that I was fascinated by was when we got there, we were asked to define the expectations of our group as we looked at other groups. What do we as taxpayers expect out of the teachers? What do teachers expect out of students or parents? The fascinating thing I found was when I looked at what the educators wanted from parents, it was to get the kids to school on time. And I immediately sort of started scribbling all over it. You know, what about homework? What about a safe study space? What about, <laughs> what about? So, I admired the process, and I think Frank is exactly the man to put that together. So without further ado, I'm gonna ask you to welcome to our stage here, Frank Edelboot, the Commissioner of Education. Frank, thank you, thank you for coming. You need to speak in that. Okay. <laughs> Take care. Thank you, Ray, I appreciate that. And thank you for having me this evening. I'm kind of excited to spend a little bit of time with you and share with you, and, I, and somebody to keep the mic close so that you can hear me, everybody can hear me okay. Um, spend a little time and share with you some of the things that are going on at the department. Uh, this is gonna be a little bit of a different presentation because I knew I was coming to a taxpayer group. Typically, when I come to speak to a group, I talk a lot about education, uh, instructional practice, pedagogy, how we get students to their best and brightest outcomes that they possibly can have. And I am happy to engage in conversation about that, but again, because it's a taxpayer group, I thought that I would spend a little bit of time talking about the business um, aspect and the finance aspect behind uh, the education work that we do here in the state. And I have three themes that I kind of wanted to focus on. Good evening, Drew. Our state board chair just walked in. Uh, you're late. <laughs> Tardy, do you have a slip? <laughs> um, so the three things, are the top, kind of the themes that I want to focus on are, you know, and this is kind of, this may be vernacular for me, but I think about blocking and tackling. In business, we, when I say the term blocking and tackling, I mean just kind of the basic business processes to make sure that they are working well, uh, that the ships are running on time, so to speak, and the trains are running on time. I guess ships sail on time. Um, so blocking and tackling, accountability, um, you know, and in well, you know, organizations that function well, there are good systems of accountability. And then the third aspect that I want to focus on is transparency. And so many of you know, when I first took this role, one of the first things that I asked the legislature to allow me to do was to organize the department differently. Um, my goal in doing that was twofold. On the one hand, the way that we were organized was not consistent with what was enumerated in the statutes. 
And I thought it's a good idea if we actually follow what's in the statutes. And so wanted to reorganize that, but also wanted to try and find ways to structure the department so that we could be more effective in the mission for that organization. And so we went through um, a relatively um, you know, thorough process of looking at all of the different bureaus and divisions that we have in the department, um, helping to establish some stuff that I know many of you who have worked in large organizations and some small organizations, you know, some accountability uh, in terms of who is authorized to do what and when they're authorized to do it, and if they're not authorized to do it, what they have to do about that, um, how the communication channels work, um, and so we implemented things like that. So one of the basic aspects that I put in place was um, really a financial accountability process whereby on a quarterly basis I asked the bureau chiefs to come in and explain here's their budget, here's their actual, how are they doing against that, are they meeting the program objectives that they have, um, and if they're not, why not? Um, and just those, and again, it seems so simple, doesn't it? But these are some of the basic processes that just didn't exist in that kind of blocking and tackling environment. And so, let me share with you a couple of examples that kind of illustrate where we were as an organization. And when I talk about this, I'm gonna break this, I have those three themes, but I'm gonna talk first about the Department of Education, then I'm gonna be talking about education in the districts, and then talk a little bit of prospective kinds of things. So this is relative to the Department of Education. So a couple of months ago, uh, I was at my desk and I had my signing folder, which there's a lot of things that end up in that signing folder, and uh, many of you who have been in positions of responsibility know what that signing folder looks like, right? You get all the stuff you have to approve. And there was an invoice in there for $115,000, uh, that had been sent to me by one of our uh, bureaus, and it was for student assessments, for 50,000 student assessments. So these are assessments that we would pay for the assessment from the assessment company, and um, the students would take those assessments, and we would hopefully use that information in order to uh, form the instructional practice for those kids, see if they're learning or they're not learning. So being, uh, you know, just not new to the, to the space, I guess, I looked at the invoice, it's for $115,000, and it says on the invoice it's for 50,000 assessments. So I set up a meeting with the bureau chief, not knowing what it was, say, can you explain this to me? Um, so they came in, and I said, well, um, these assessments, how do we use them? So they began to explain how they use those assessments. That was good, step one. Um, I said, well, how are our students doing on these assessments? Are, they, are the students improving? You know, do they show if you do you know, the assessments over time? Are kids getting smarter, hopefully, through that process? And there was a, a bit of a blank stare, like, well, I'm not really sure, right? Well, I'm like, well, that's really important information. If we're gonna pay for something, we wanna make sure that we're getting something out of it. And then my last question, I said, well, how many of these assessments are we using every year? And again, a bit of a blank stare, well, I'm like, we really need to go find that information out before I can authorize this invoice, because I'm not gonna put my name on it if I don't know what, I don't know what it's doing or how we're, you know, what we're getting for it. So we went back and, uh, or he went back to the vendor and we did some research, took about a week or so, and came back and so we have used, now bear in mind, this is a five-year contract for 50,000 assessments per year. We were in the third year of the contract, and the most assessments we had ever used was 4,000. <laughs> 4,000. And so I just said, I can't sign that invoice, right? Like, I'm not gonna put my name on that. Uh, so we went back to the vendor and we renegotiated. And I don't believe that there was any malice, but think about blocking and tackling. Nobody you know, who is working in a commercial environment, I don't think, would present an invoice to their boss to get approved for 50,000 invoices if we're only using 4,000, probably. <laughs> Um, but that isn't necessarily the process. From an accountability standpoint, if we're gonna pay vendors for something, hopefully we're getting something back for it. Transparency, we should know what we're getting for. Um, so this is kind of a bit of the culture that we are working on in terms of thinking about blocking and tackling, accountability and transparency. And so I spend a lot of my time in the department and I think this is appropriate time spent. My role is to help mature the organization so that they know what good accountability looks like, they know what transparency looks like, looks like, they know what blocking and tackling looks like as an organization. 
So another example of this kind of at the DOE in terms of uh, blocking, attacking, accountability, and transparency um, is you know a, a budget process. So I kind of explained how we would have the folks come in and on a quarterly basis and present, here's what your budget is, here's the actual spending. And there was a relatively significant variance or shortage really on one of the lines for compensation. It was a very small bureau. And it was clear that at the current run rate that the salary line was only going to get us about halfway through the year and we were going to come up short by the end of the year. So in the conversation with the, the bureau administrator, I said, well, how did we come up with this budget? Because clearly at the current run rate, you're not going to get to the end of the year. So, you know, how did we, you know, what, was the, what was the calculus that went into deriving this budget? And the comment was, well, we just used last year's actual number. And we're like, well, last year, that position was only filled half the time. So the actual number is only half a year's worth of budget. And I'm like, so they're looking at me like, okay. <laughs> so I'm like, how are we going to pay you for the rest of the year if you only have half a year's budget to be able to pay yourself, right? This is for the bureau administrator's salary line item. And so we worked that out. But again, just stuff that you would just take for granted, you know, sometimes in a large organization, perhaps in a governmental entity, there's not that you know, blocking and tackling that basic, you know, stuff that you just take for granted. There is not some of that accountability and that transparency that needs to be in there. Um, and let's see, I want to, so then I want to just talk about another aspect of this kind of, uh, you know, blocking and tackling, accountability, transparency at the department. And this deals with our rules, and I know Drew has to deal with rules quite a bit. Um, but one of the areas that the department has responsibility for are career schools, um, which are not really the typical K-12 system that you're familiar with, but if somebody wants to teach some, anywhere from like a dog grooming school to uh, Sig Sauer Academy or something like that. And when we began to look at, or when I began to look at the approval process for these schools, what I realized is that we collected a lot of information, right? So one of the things that we got from these schools was uh, curriculum. And I'm not sure why we were getting the curriculum, although it said in the rules that we were supposed to get the curriculum. But imagine, so we've got an administrator in a bureau that's looking at curriculum that ranges from a dog groomer's curriculum to a firefighter's curriculum. I'm like, those are not equivalent things. Do we have any expertise to even be looking at curriculum that spans such a wide range of topics? We were also asking these career schools to send to us their commercial leases for their space. I don't know why, right? They're the ones who have to lease the space. So when I asked the bureau administrator, I'm like, have you ever signed a commercial lease? Would you know a good commercial lease from a lousy commercial lease? Um, and obviously, no, we have never signed a commercial lease, but we were collecting all this information because we always had. And so we worked on those rules, thanks to Drew, worked with those, worked on those. You guys did those rules as well, or is that another process? I'm trying to remember, but. Um, but anyway, so we fixed those rules and we really got them down. We took them from 16 pages down to eight pages and focused on the spirit of what the law was, which was to provide protection in case the school disappears in the middle of the night, that we've got some financial protection for those students. And we did that in a very creative and, a, and an effective way that allows those career schools to focus on their mission and us to focus on our mission and everybody's doing their part. Um, but I call that just blocking and tackling. Understand what you're trying to accomplish and then organize your processes in order to be able to achieve that. So those are some examples relative to the department, at the department level, which has oversight over the state. I want to talk a little bit now about some school activity um, in terms of, again, it's the same themes, right? So I'm seeing it kind of pers pers persistently throughout the, uh, the whole system. But there was a bill that we brought this year uh, relative to payment of adequacy to schools. And it turned out that there was an incorrect calculation at the department level for the adequacy funding that we send out to the schools. Uh, the formula as it's written requires that if a student in, so in students who take their reading assessment in third grade and if they underperform, the next year that school gets $675 uh, for those students theoretically to help them improve their reading, right? So we're giving them the extra adequacy. 
So the schools had been underpaid. When I, when I looked at the calculation the first year I came in, I just looked at it and said, like, okay, number of third graders who didn't meet the proficiency times 675 equals this much. Wait, let me go back again. Wait, students times this. Oh, that number's different. Um, and so we corrected the error and fixed it. But again, going back to blocking and tackling, just basic reconciliations, right? Accountability, transparency. So no school districts in our state noticed that. That was a disappointing aspect, right? In other words, like, so we've got, well, no, but seriously, like, in other words, like, so we don't have enough adequacy money, but I didn't send it and nobody noticed that we didn't send it. So, um, so what we have to do is we really want to, again, that's, that's somebody someplace should be reconciling the numbers, right? Making sure that if this is what I'm supposed to be getting, this is what I'm receiving on the other end of that. Um, so another aspect of that is, uh, and we're working hard on this right now, is we provide uh, a lot of grants out to schools, about $240 million a year of grants that go to schools. And the way that process works is really I'm just a pass-through entity. So I get the money in one hand, I have some formula that I get from the federal government that tells me how much to send out to every school, and I send that money out to every school. In this area, there is also a great deal of inconsistency in terms of how effective we are at utilizing those funds. And so what I mean by that is oftentimes we will grant funds to schools and schools don't use those. And you're like, wait a minute, the schools need the funding. So we're giving them grants. They have the ability to draw down those grants, but for whatever reason, they're not able to use them. Some schools do a really good job using their grant money. Other schools, not so much. So in the area of special education, what we have observed is that over the years, we have accumulated about eight, over $8 million of special education funding that we made a grant to a school saying, here's funding to be used for special education. It's not been used, so it just goes back into the coffer and we've just been sitting on it, right? Because they didn't use it and I didn't send it back. And so um, just another example of if there are schools who they manage that and they get it right down to the penny and they're using all those dollars, but there are some schools, I give them grants, I know these schools need the funding and they just are not managing it well so they're not able to take full advantage of the funds that we're actually making available to them. So another uh, example is um, at the school district, and again, this is just the blocking and tackling kinds of stuff. So we had a school district last spring that um, there was a lot of concern that they were short on their budget. They believed that they were short about a million dollars. Um, lots, of, lots of anxiety, lots of drama. You know, when you're coming up short on a budget, how do you close the gap? What are you gonna do about it? The, uh, the governing body ultimately approved an additional uh, half a million dollars for that district. Um, and then about a month and a half ago, the district said, Oops, we actually have 500,000 too much money now. <laughs> and you're exactly, it ruins your credibility when that happens. But so I, I sat down with the district and I tried to figure out like, how could this happen? Like, where, what's going on? And it just turned out when we thought we were sure, we hadn't actually closed the books, right? So we don't, we just thought we were short a half a million dollars, but we hadn't done the accounting every month to even know if we were done. We actually just closed the books on that last fiscal year in the last two months, which is where we discovered we actually were, had more money than we thought we had. So. Again, just the theme, if nothing else, is just you know blocking and tackling, um, trying to uh, you know have basic practices. So this is not rocket science. Like these are things that we could really you know every one of these schools could really work on. Um, and then the last thing I want to talk about relative to school districts was a, a, a change that I implemented, um, which I think is designed really to help in some of this blocking and tackling, and that is um, relative to assurances. So every year I have to make an attestation to the federal government that we have used this 240 million federal funds in accordance with the law and under penalty of perjury, and I think I can get in trouble. And the way that that works is that I rely on attestations from the local schools. So in the past, superintendents have said that they've used the money correctly. I add up all those, att those assurances that they give me, and on that basis, then I make my assurances. Um, but 
one of the things that we did this year is it's about 13 pages of assurances. It's all this critical information that schools are supposed to be looking at, that they're monitoring, that they're you know, basic internal control types of, it, of aspects. And so this year, I added to those assurances the, board, the school boards, right? Because school boards are part of the internal control system. It's not only supposed to be superintendents, but good governance requires that school boards pay attention to what's going on in the schools over which they have supervisory responsibility. So I just, I share that as kind of an example of, you know, basic blocking and tackling, you know, who's accountable, who's watching over things, who's, you know, being held accountable to what's going on. So again, you can see those themes kind of, uh, you know, the blocking and tackling, accountability, transparency. Um, you know, and all of these things are important as we kind of want to move education forward. And I often, when I'm talking about education funding, I like to, um, to kind of split the conversation a little bit this way, in that, you know, because everybody's like, well, Frank, you know, do schools need more money? Should they have, do they have too much money? I, you know, and I basically say, there's two questions, and I think it's better if you parse them. One is, how much money do we have in the schools or have available for education? And then what do we do with the money that we do have, right? And you can see most of what I have been talking about tonight is, how do I spend and invest the funds that I do have well so that I can get a good educational outcome? And this is another, again, kind of a basic thing, but I recently wrote an op-ed on this, and I don't know if anybody had a chance to read it, but we get about $40 million a year uh, in Title I, and that funding is basically used to invest in schools that are underperforming, right? They, their students don't have high achievement levels. And so we also then hire consultants, education consultants, to work with those schools to spend that money well to be able to help turn around those schools and get better educational achievement. And so I had the opportunity to read the proposals that we got back from uh, a variety of consult education consulting vendors. And um, you know, it was a couple hundred pages worth of documents, but I like reading. And, when I got done reading those, I said to my team, I said, you know, I can summarize these proposals in one sentence. You know, we've been turning around the same schools for 40 years, right? And yeah, you're supposed to laugh because I was like, ah, oh, it just seems like the same thing again and again. Um, but it was really, I, that, that was my impression, but it was interesting because then this month, just earlier this month, there was a report that came out, a study that came out from the University of Virginia that analyzed these turnaround consulting companies in the Title I space. And they looked at 151 of those companies, nobody in New Hampshire, um, and they discovered that of the 151, seven had actually ever turned around a school and, and improve, improved the achievement, right? So again, it's, so we, we, we can spend a lot of time talking about, about how much money we spend, but we also need to make sure that the money that we are spending, we're spending effectively. And how am I doing on time, Ray? What's that? Plenty? Okay. Well, then I'm just going to, I'm going to, um, you know, just talk a little bit about, uh, you know, pedagogy and instruction and stuff like that at this point in time, because we talk a lot about, you know, I'm sitting here sharing all this kind of blocking and tackling, which is the business of education, but let's look at how we're doing. So New Hampshire is one of the top performing states in terms of the K-12 system across the country, right? So I just need to make sure we set that baseline. <laughs> so that's the good news. <laughs> so what that means relative to students who are in the system is that we set a standard for what students should know, right? We say, here's what you need to know to be successful in the 21st century. We get less than half of our kids to that goal through assessments by the time they're in 11th grade, and we graduate 90% of our kids, okay? Here's what you need to be successful. We get half of the kids to the goal, and we graduate 90% of the kids. You don't have to be good at math to figure out that there's a gap there. But when you begin to analyze those results, you begin to see that there's something that's referred to as the equity gap, the performance equity gap. It is in education, it's been persistent in education for 30, 40 years. And what that means is, if you happen to come from an economically disadvantaged home, 
your assessment results are going to be about 20% less than that 50%, right? If 50% is where the average is, you're gonna be 20% less. You know, if you're a minority student, you're gonna be further down. If you have a uh, IEP, so a learning disability that you're dealing with, but you're, you should be taking the assessment, you're gonna be even less. And so, we have to say, like, as we're investing money in turnaround and in blocking and tackling and assessment invoices, what is it that we are, um, what is it that we're getting for this investment? And maybe, Think about it, if they've been working on this equity gap, and in New Hampshire, that equity gap exists, right? That 20 points is in New Hampshire, and it's growing, right? It's not shrinking, it's still increasing. So maybe if we've been working on this thing for 30 or 40 years, the way of, that we're going about trying to close it needs some different way of thinking. Like we need to stop trying a lot of the same things. We keep trying to find ways to do the same thing, uh, you know, but faster or harder or something like that. Anybody, you know, I used to describe um, kind of uh, uh, processes in business. You know, somebody who has a really lousy process in their company, and then they come along and they say to you, we need to automate this, right? So we can have the errors faster, right? We can kick out bad transactions more quickly at that point in time, right? As opposed to, first you need good processes, then you can, you can speed them up, right? Um, but simply making it faster, doing the same, doing more of the same thing doesn't necessarily change the outcome. So we need to change that outcome. And I will tell you that I think when you're looking at system change, in order to make system change, you really have to change how you see that system. Like any system is built on premises that you believe about the system. And our current education system is built on a premise, I believe, that you can manage students as a cohort, right? You can group a certain number of kids together based on the day that they were born. And based on the day that they were born, uh, you can move them through the system. And there's a, very, there's a lot of different indicators that this cohort is persistent or obvious in here. Um, so for example, one, many people may have heard, you, we say often in education, all students should read in third grade. Anybody ever hear that before? Right, okay, all students should be in third grade. This is one of the dumbest things I've ever heard because there are kids who should be reading in kindergarten. There's kids who should be reading in second grade. But if they're reading in second grade and it's not third grade, or they're not reading in second grade, even though they should be, but they're not in third grade, we don't think that that's a problem because it's not third grade yet, right? I mean, like learning, we've built kind of a linear learning model, but kids learn, the science of learning will tell you that you learn the way you grow. It's a very jagged process, right? I say people, that, you know, if you don't know how kids learn, open up the closet if you have kids and you'll have those little pen marks, sometimes it's in Sharpie about how your kids were growing and they got bigger and bigger. Sometimes those lines are close together, sometimes they're far apart because they're, it's very jagged, right? And so if you've got this linear learning model, but kids are growing in a very jagged way, but it's July 19th, what do we do? We peg everybody to the line and move on to the next year. And so what happens is when you, you're gonna pull some kids down to the line, you're gonna have to move some kids up to that line, you're gonna create gaps in what they've learned, and you're gonna move along, and that ship is just sailing and it's moving along. Um, so another example of kind of this cohort model that I think is important is, um, to, or it's just an example, is, you know, what is the ideal class size? Anybody ever hear that? Like, what size class should we have? Should it be 20? Should it be 25? Should it be 18? Should it be 15? And uh, what I would tell you, what's that? 30, okay. Well, what I would tell you is it's just, you would only ask that question of how big should a class be if you believe that you could group kids in cohorts and manage them as a homogeneous cohort. Because what I'll tell you is you could have 20. And there are kids in that cohort of 20 who are so high functioning and they've got, you know, they're more mature and you could put them in a class, a lecture hall with 75 kids and they would thrive and they'd be fine. And there are other kids that you could put them in a group of five and they're gonna struggle. Here's a, is an interesting um, uh, observation. I don't know what the conclusion of this is, but I'll just share it with you. There's a book, Malcolm Gladwell. Gladwell. Yes, Outliers. Okay, and Malcolm Gladwell's book, Outliers, he does, he um, found this phenomenon. So pro hockey players, I don't know if anybody's ever heard this, but professional hockey players are statistically disproportionately born in January, February, and March. I don't know if you guys knew that or not, kind of an odd thing. When I present that to people, they're saying like, oh, is that because it's winter? No, it has nothing to do with winter, right? Okay, so they peeled this thing back and they began to look at it. And if you go back to the Pee Wee League, which starts at like six years old, they have a cutoff date of January 1st. And so when they do the tryouts for that Pee Wee League, 
The kids who are born in January could be as much as almost 12 months older than that kid who was born in December. And so they just are a whole lot more mature than those kids. And so what happens is those kids who are more mature, a little stronger, a little faster, they get recruited on the A team and the other kids end up on the B team. And the kids who are on the A team, they get the best coaches. The kids on the A team get the most ice time. And so that disparity between those kids when they're six years old continues to grow until you have disproportionately number of professional hockey players who are born in January, February, and March. When I read this, I got to thinking to myself, I'm like, I give assessments. So I don't know what the conclusion is, but I can tell you that when I look at my assessment for my third through eighth graders, you know, the students who are younger when that assessment is given perform five to 15% less than the kids who are older, just because of when their birthday was, right? And so I don't know what the conclusion is. What happens? Do those kids get a higher IEP? Does something happen in the instruction? Do they get tagged as being the not smart kids? When it's just because they got born on a day, right? They had nothing to do with that. So we need to be willing to really think about whether this cohort model is the right one. And I would, surmise, I believe, that you know, managing students by cohort is not an effective way to look at the education system. Again, because that premise drives how you see the system, the questions that you ask about it. Um, and so, okay, so Ray's giving me, get, wrap her up here quick, okay. okay. Oh yeah, I gotta go to that one too, I forgot about that. Um, okay, so, so what I will tell you is, here's the new premise, you guys think about this. Students, kids, are inherently curious and they want to learn. And if you don't believe that, leave a three-year-old alone in the kitchen for an hour and come back and see what's going on. See if they're waiting for someone to give them a worksheet. If you don't believe that, leave three teenagers on a street corner in Manchester and see if you come back four hours later and they're saying, well, what was our instructions? You know, what was the assignment? No, they're gonna find things to do. Okay, all that said, I wanna talk, I'm, going, I'm gonna spin back to Blocking and tackling, accountability and transparency. And I have, I have some stuff that we've been working on that I'm gonna show you um, in, that kind of supports those ideas. And I'm, I'm breaking the cardinal rule. This is early technology, we've not released it, but I just wanna preview it for you so you can begin to see what's up there. I'm hopeful that everything will work. Um, and if it doesn't, eventually it will. Um, but the goal behind some of this is, you know, blocking and tackling, some good information, accountability, because there's transparency that's taking place. So I wanna introduce you to what we're referring to as the iPortal for Education. And hang on one second, I'm gonna log in here. Okay, so the iPortal is basically made up of four components. It's got something called iReport, it's got something called iDiscover, uh, it's got some iExplore, I, uh, and iDefine. I think those are the four components as we're putting this together. So iReport, I'm gonna show you iReport and iExplore tonight. Um, so this iReport is basically static data. So this is information about the schools that we are required to uh, report to the federal government. And um, so this will be coming out and you'll have an opportunity if you want to uh, look at different schools or something like that but basically you just sit down you figure or drop down and you see what you're gonna look at you can view a list um, and you'll see there's a bunch of different you know you got all your different towns and stuff like that I saw somebody from Amherst so we'll grab Amherst here okay I, I could do ASD too um, so essentially what you have is in a profile, and again, this is static information. So you've basically got, you're in the profile and you have the basic information about the school, uh, you know, how many students, and again, all this is information I'm required to disclose by uh, federal regulation. It tells you the genders, the, um, the diversity in there, the different student populations, you know, percent economically disadvantaged, English learners, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, then you have an overview, and here you can basically get the overview, or you can look at student achievements, student growth, the school environment, educators, finance. Not all of this is populated at this particular point in time, but as an, I'll just grab one here. So here's student growth. So you can see kind of how your school might be doing in terms of growth. Um, and the reason I, I really focus a lot on growth because it's not just achievement. You can have high achieving, but if you got high achieving kids, they still got to grow every year. And so it's kind of growth and achievement in terms of the, the metrics that we're looking at, or you may come along and you look at, um, let's see, uh, school environment, 
includes, again, you know, federally mandated data that we put out. So here's, you know, in-school suspensions, percent of, and these are pretty small numbers I picked on Amherst. There's some other districts that have bigger bars. Uh, safety, disciplinary incidents, average class sizes, uh, students receiving in-school suspension. So you have a little bit of trend information. You can see uh, data over time. Um, and so basic state, you know, information about it. Um, there is also the IDEA reporting that we're required to disclose, and this is gonna give you information about, uh, you know, students' graduation rates, the dropout rates, assessment participation performance, evaluation timelines, um, you know, so you would just be able to click here and you can see, so the state, this uh, is this, the state target is this, percent who've graduated. This one didn't show anybody graduated. Hmm. I'm not sure what that is. Uh, well, that would be for ID, IP, IEP students. So they maybe just haven't populated this yet. Like I said, this is preliminary data that they're loading everything. So there, this is, so this is gonna be your um, kind of a static report. And then we have another dashboard. This is the kind of the iExplore dashboard. And this includes some different information. Assuming it's all gonna work there. And uh, this includes a little bit more historical data, so you can jump back and you can look at different, um, you know, years, so you can see some history on there. Um, at the Explorer level, this is a dropdown of different types of metrics. I've loaded 15 in here, you know, so percent of administrative expenses, percent of disadvantaged students, percent ELA growth, ELA proficiency, a percent of experienced teachers, the students to non-teacher staff ratio, the students to total staff ratio. And again, I have about 50 of these metrics. We're gonna start loading it with just this. Uh, you can also, and then you'll be able to just, you can scroll down, you can kind of see see how those different schools are doing. If you want, you can just look at it by, you can click down, you can just pick a particular school. If you want, you can browse it at the district levels or the different types of schools. And we've created some regions for you um, to be able to look at, and it will give you some graphical presentations as well as a little, you know, some stuff there. So another is iDiscover, and this is where you get to little, build a little bit more queries yourself, and so you get to juxtapose a couple of different things. And again, you'll have fun playing with this is really what will happen is, I, I hope there was endless hours of fun for all of you as you begin to kind of drill down on, this is, this is accountability, this is transparency, and just, my goal for this is really that this spurs conversations in communities, because not every community is gonna solve their education problems the same. One district may have high in-school suspensions because they'd rather suspend that kid in school and keep teaching them than kick them out of the school. Another school may, they have a different philosophy and they go some other way. So there's not a right or wrong answer in here. I'm not grading any schools, but I'm trying to create tools that create conversations in schools for folks to really work on how to improve the education in their communities. So I appreciate you letting me come and share with you tonight, and I am sorry for going so long, Ray, and thank you so much. Any questions? Frank, we take some questions. I've got the first one. Tell us a bit about the study that looked at the different expectations of various groups in the education process. I'm not sure I understand the question. Just different expectations of what groups? The study team that I was on. Oh, okay. So, and so answer, ask the question again. You're talking about the stakeholder group, yes. Tell us, tell us about what you did with that and what to expect from it. Well, so this is what to expect from it, quite frankly. So we pulled a stakeholder group together and we talked to different folks about, you know, how can we create a, a tool, a platform uh, that is going to stimulate conversations in communities about what's going on in the school. So that, you know, whether you're a taxpayer, you're a teacher, you're an administrator, you're a student, you can say, why, is our, why does our school look like this compared to maybe another school? Or why do we see this trend going in our school? Is that what we want? Is this our objective or is it not our objective? So that was really the goal of that stakeholder group. Thank you. Question. Good. Uh, hi, Frank. Uh, testing, we're gonna talk, and hopefully at some point I'll get my voice back on. This is recording on here. 
Okay. Uh, so in case the audience knows, I'm a, uh, an alderman, and I was an alderman in Nashville for six years, just a little bit of background. Um, I love budgets, I eat this data, I eat that up left and right. And so the question, I have three questions, I'm only gonna ask one and then, then wait and see how it goes and maybe ask the other two. Um, as a way of background, so this, for the school budgets, uh, for any of the budget for uh, in general, 80% of the, the money that's spent on a municipal budget, and probably for any budget anywhere, for any organization, 80% of it is, is labor hours. And even the material that you purchase, at some point you bought from a company that charged you for that product because of labor hours. And so what that means in the, in the context of a school, that the amount of money you spend on a school is the number of teachers and staff that you hire for that school. So if a school is going to spend money, the only mechanism a school has to spend money is, is hiring and, and firing teachers or whatever. And maybe they could hire teachers to do a better job. Uh, but that's not the question. That's sort of where, to give you an idea of how, the, sort of the way I think. So in Nashua, uh, I, it's, I had the opportunity to be in a control uh, experiment in that it's one district of 11,000 students across uh, a, a diversity of neighborhoods. And so we have like Bicentennial School, which is like one of the highest performing schools in the country as a public school. And then we have uh, Norman Crisp, which is one of the lowest performing schools in the country. And they're in the same district. So the reason for those schools doing well or bad has nothing to do with the curriculum or the administration or anything that's, uh, that's, that's uh, architecturally a part of the school being a better school system because the same board of ed, the same principal, the same, same everything. The difference, the parents and the students. So if you are in a neighborhood where the parents teach the kids in the, to want to learn, you end up having a school that does well. If you're in a neighborhood that where the parents don't teach the students to do well, the students do poorly. So my so my perspective of how to improve the public school system in the country is biased to conclude that the only way you can improve the schools in the country is by improving the communities. So there's really nothing an organization, a, 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 a commissioner can do. The question to you is you got to see New Hampshire as a whole. Is that the same across the, the New Hampshire where that good schools are due to good communities or are there actual mechanical ways that schools can be better than others? So two ways I'll respond to that. So one is, and I mean, what you've pointed out is really the equity gap that I was talking about, right? So generally, and if a community has uh, a higher percentage of economically disadvantaged students because they, you know, overall perform lower, your achievement will be lower in that school, right? And so I think it, you have to be careful that um, it's, is it, when you say it's because the parents are, you know, engaged or not, or can those students learn, I believe that whether you're economically disadvantaged or not economically disadvantaged, you can learn. The question is, can we build a system that allows a student that comes from a family that is economically disadvantaged to be able to engage? So as an, as an example that I sometimes talk about is, if we've built a system that uh, requires a student to sit in his seat and receive instruction. And you come from a family where you're sitting down at the dinner table at night and you're practicing how to sit still and listen and take instruction. Um, you're going to be a lot e more successful in that environment as opposed to the student who maybe doesn't have that. He's not having a family dinner at home. He's used to standing up and moving around. Maybe can we create an environment that engages that student? And I can tell you we can. Um, today I was in a school and it was in a middle school. I was with some eighth grade students. And and we were uh, visiting the high school, introducing them to the CTE centers, so the Career and Technical Education Centers. And there were a cohort of five students in that group who all of the educators were really, really nervous to even take them out of the building because these kids had been in trouble all week long, starting fights in the you know, lunchroom and getting into trouble. We took them there and we gave them a project working on, they had to make crates uh, they were making crates to carry chickens to the market, <laughs> literally. And these kids, the, the educators were surprised. Like, these kids were totally paying attention. They were working on it. They were doing their, they were measuring stuff. They were cutting stuff. They were drilling stuff. They were learning. 
because it was a different kind of learning. It wasn't some abstract concept. They had a mission. I got a whole bunch of roosters that I got to take to market, and we need a bunch of crates to get the roosters to market, and so we're going to work on it. So I think what we have to do is we have to be more creative in terms of how we engage students. I think that all students are inherently curious and they want to learn. Our job as an education system is to unlock that. And I'll give you one more example of that is in Nashua. Um, we are working on an Algebra 1 class in uh, robotics. So we are taking the robot, you know, we do a lot of stuff with robots, and we have built the Algebra 1 learning into the robotics class. So those kids are not going to learn Algebra 1, which is one of the co courses that really trips up a whole bunch of kids, in an abstract concept. They're going to actually learn Algebra 1, working with robots, figuring out angles, figuring out the, the um, calculus and the algebra to, to figure out how that robot's going to work and the gearing and everything. And so they're going to be able to do that in a much more tactile way. And the kids are going to be interested in learning and they'll learn. So I think they have the capacity, but I think we have to have a system that allows them to learn. Frank, real quick, um, this is a wonderful program, a wonderful tool, but it also really spotlights not only what a, a school district is doing well, but what they're not doing well. And my question is, how are the administrators cooperating with this because all of a sudden you're, you're bringing transparency to the to the situation and they don't like transparency in my in my opinion and in my experience with with uh, administrators of school districts they just say we need more money we need more money and leave it to us we're the educators now you are spotlighting what that school is doing or not doing and how are they reacting as far as the administrators are concerned? So, so I think what I'm trying to do here is um, create conversations, right? So rather than, so you're starting with a statement, here's what they're doing well, or here's what they're not doing well. So you're making value judgments about some of the decisions up there. So you may have a district that is investing heavily. They have a high percentage of students with IEPs. Well, that may be the decision that that community has decided that they want to pursue. So that's not a well or not well, it's just a difference. And so what I'm hoping here is that this will create those conversations about what do we as a district value and what do we want to invest in and what do we not want to invest in. And to your point, Steve, it's transparent. So now we can actually have those conversations, whereas up to this point in time, it was difficult to have those conversations because we didn't have transparency to the information. How you get cooperation? Yes. Frank, Fred Platt. I'm a beneficiary this year of a couple thousand dollars reduction in my taxes from what was normal. And that came about from an overcharge over the last several years in school side in, in Goffstown. And it came about uh, because of a report filed with the, your department on revenues, uh, which was inaccurate. And the, I don't think there's anything dishonest. The business manager resigned, a good friend of mine. I, it was screw up. But how can you go that many years and not notice something? And how can you go that many years without the state looking and say, is this report right? So, so just to be clear, that that was the Department of Revenue, not the Department of Education. Um, but, <laughs> but I, I mean, uh, again, it goes back to blocking and tackling, reconciliations, accountability, transparency. I mean, that's just good. I mean, I get those aren't hard things to fix. Those are good, solid business practices that I hope many of you will engage with your schools because I know you have a lot of capability in that area. Say, how can I help you? You know, figure out what the best way is to do some of those good business practices. You mentioned uh, graduation rates, so I'll, I'll give you a lead in, okay? Freshman class of 100, four years later, 75 walk across the stage to get their diplomas. Do you follow the KISS principle and say that school had a 75% rate, or do you drill down and find out what happened to the 25 who didn't make it to become seniors at that school? Uh, so I don't know the details of the calculations. So I don't want to try and guess that. Um, I do know that New Hampshire has one of the highest graduation rates in the country. Um, you know, we're up at about 88% overall. Um, we try, you know, so I think it's going to be all, in other words, like, so what would be, as long as those students haven't left the, uh, the state, then they're still counted in our overall rates, right? So if they started with 100 and they're down to 75, those 25 kids are someplace, though, so they're being counted in someone's numbers. Okay. Can I follow up on that for just a second? So 
Are you looking at, did those students leave and go to another town? Um, not trying to be morbid, did any of them die? Did they uh, move out of state, et cetera? Do, how far do you drill down in, in, in analyzing and coming up with the actual graduation rate? So the graduation rate is based on those students who are eligible for graduation that graduate, right? So they, t they age out of the system at 18. Right, so if they leave the state, I'm not going to count them in my graduation rate. Um, you know, but otherwise, if they're in the state, I'm counting them in my numbers. You're up front, so he doesn't see you. <laughs> Mike Thornton, Milford. Uh, I have a two-part question. Number one, it seems that the parents of the children who are listed as not having the resources required to learn at as high a rate as others. It occurs that there's a building, at least one, in town where every night those resources are primarily unused and are available and should be used. Number two. Oh, I'm referring to the, uh, I think they call it a school, in, you know, in charge of learning. And the children, uh, we, we need to think of those children who the parents are failing, and we are failing the parents, because as a dog trainer does not train your dog, they train you on how to train your dog. These parents need to be able to understand how they can assist and lift up their children to higher levels of success later. Those resources at night are unused. That means they cost us too much. We ought to be, let's see, you're an accountant, so we ought to be spreading the cost of that equipment among a longer number of hours. And that would give us the better use and like education with industry, I know industry would come in at night to teach those classes. So those are good options, and I don't disagree that we have to make sure we stand up parents, to your point, really, uh, you know, Dan, it's, I mean, if we can equip parents, then that's gonna be a good first line of defense there. Thanks. Um, I have to disagree with this gentleman here about needing a better class of, of students and parents. Um, there are plenty of cases where um, a charter school and a public school are in the same building, they have the same uh, neighborhood, uh, people go to the charter school based on a lottery, et cetera, but they have wildly different results. Um, so it's not about just about parents or maybe it's somehow about how schools interact with parents. Um, one question I had was how does, um, we're currently paying for failure. You, you explained that, that state a, um, adequate education money is higher when the students don't perform than it, than it is when they do. Should that be the opposite? Could we get, in my school, 23% uh, of kids are proficient in math. It's ridiculous, right? It should be 75%. Uh, should we pay, should, or 100%, whatever, maybe 100% is not realistic. But anyways, should we pay for success when it's 50% or 75%, they get more money than when it's 25%. So, I mean, I think that that's a great, those are the kinds of conversations that I think need to happen, you know, in communities that say, should we be, you know, have a, an incentive system, a performance-based system? There are many states around the country right now who are looking at performance-based funding systems, I will tell you that. Frank, I'm Howard Kalugian. Uh, from where, and I have a question and then a comment. My question is, what is the teacher to administrator ratio throughout the state? And my comment is education is generally peppered full of the left. I mean, they, it is the wheelhouse of the left that they go into education. You might feel like you're standing alone sometime as a, a, as a conservative, but I want you to know, we're all behind you, and we think you're doing a great job. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know that off the top of my head, but if you go into the system in another week or so, you can look it up. <laughs> By school, if you want. 
Has, has Betsy DeVos put forward any initiatives and have they been helpful? I think if there's anything, well, she's, Betsy DeVos has put forth a number of different initiatives. Um, you know, so her stuff is dealing at a very high level in terms of what's going on in the states. She's tried very hard to try and create and add flexibility to the system. Um, and we have tried to take advantage of that where we can. Um, I will tell you that the, uh, the US Department of Ed on a number of occasions, like I have several people's cell phones down there and when I have an issue that I need to deal with, I'm able to get it taken care of. So that's probably the best, uh, you know, that, that's the best level of support that I'm getting and I think it's great, so. Okay. Frank, um, I'm hearing a lot about reporting requirements for this, reporting requirements for that. How much of our education budget is going to duplicative reporting? So, I mean, I do carefully look at grants that are coming across to make sure that the reporting requirements associated with a grant are both things that we can live with in terms of the information that we're going to have to potentially disclose, as well as the cost of maintaining the grant. Um, and so far, there was one that was right on the cusp. I'm like, do I really want this grant? Like, I got to do all, I got to jump through all these hoops. But then you look at the value associated with the funds and how I can deploy those, and hopefully they're in a very strategic area. Um, and so far, I I felt like it was worth it to, to go forward with those grants at this point in time. But it but it's a, the right question to ask. One last question then. Uh, before the question, I'll mention the, the 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 charter school issue actually supports what I was trying to say in that the reason charter schools are successful is because the people who they choose to go to the charter school. So even though it's a lot, yes, it is. Uh, the charter schools don't take people out of the public school. The people put their name into the charter school lottery and then they're selected. So the people that end up in charter schools are, by, they self-select. Self and so what you end up with is this, uh, people in charter schools by their very nature want to learn. And, and so, the, or the parents want their kids to learn. And, and as a conservative, I believe that the responsibility should be on the community and the parents and not on the government and the taxpayers' burden to pay for, to pour more money into an unsuccessful school. But the question has nothing to do with any of that. So you were talking about the idea, the current, the current uh, idea of having people by grades, you said it's peer grouping or what was it? Cohort, cohort, cohort. cohort. I totally agree with the idea that uh, you would like to be able to have people who are, who are, who are successful move at, along their pace and the people that are less successful move along at their pace and everybody moves at a pace. But practically speaking, it's hard to implement unless you have a massive number of students that can all share a common building so that you can have classes because one person may be good at math and one person may be good at English. It's not always the same person. So how would you suggest implementing the idea of this change? Yep, so I believe that it is implementable. Um, I don't think we can go into all the details tonight because it's a little bit you know, more developed than that. But you have, but don't, like it, when, just even when I'm listening to your question, like try not to bring a lot of your presuppositions about how school works to that conversation. If you can start more with a blank slate, um, we are in a world where we have achieved in many industries what I refer to as mass customization, right? I mean, so there are, you know, high volumes of stuff that can come through that are unique to the purchaser of that product or, or uh, service. And so why can't that be the same case in, in education as well? Okay, Frank, well, thank you very much for coming out yeah. tonight. <laughs> Good job, as always. <laughs>